asked this question. I asked this question to some random adults, Oxford Circus Station, outside UCL, outside my station. What can your hands do? And we collected lots and lots of responses. And this is pretty much, on average, what an average person would do. I tried to avoid peak rush hour or when people are pushing and shoving to get the train. I tried to um, pick. Uh, I tried to avoid being specific about where I'm picking up these people from. God, that sounds really bad. Um, but this is, in effect, the kind of things we got from them. Very, very day-to-day -day tasks that you probably would do with your hands. And I asked the same question to children. And these children are aged roughly 3 to 12, year, roughly three to 12 years of age. And to be really honest, for me, that looks like, wow, your life is so much fun than mine. <laughs> so much more fun than mine. I'm a teacher, and it is fun, but it's not that fun. Um, and this started raising questions to me. I started, started, started hitting some, some key points in my life as a teacher um, in terms of learning, experiential learning, and what's going on, and why things are, why, why adults and teenagers, um, so sort of 14 to 19-year-olds, are not thinking the same way as those three-year-olds. I have a short clip to show Tell you. Tell me, what, ca what can you do with your hands? What? What else can you do? Dry. What else can you do? Grab cups and drink them. Wow, well done. What else can you do? You can, you can pick up stones and put them in your bucket. Very good. What else can you do? You can lift up phones. Very good. What else can you do? You can open the oven. Can you do a lot with your hands then? Yeah. What's your favourite thing to do with your hands? Ice cream! Say bye. Wouldn't you like to do all those things with your hands? Um, this is, again, from, from other children, slightly older than, than her uh, in the video. And um, you can obviously take a very, very easy guess that the, the, per the, the child on, the, on, on my left um, is probably somebody that likes to craft a lot, likes to make, doodle, draw, but also a reader. Um, and this is someone that's slightly older than that child. So you can actually see the level of creativity, the level of... Of, of complex views, the metaphors, the similes, the analogies, um, and the thinking behind it. And this is because children, um, children have a physical sense of the world, and this is shaped by their experiences. We want them to play with things with their hands. We want them to play, engage in imaginary play. We want them to build blocks. We want them to make a train track, get your hands messy in some sand, blow some bubbles. We want all of this for our children so that their brains develop uh, normally and happily. And, this, and, and what's crucial about this is, in a child's world, it's their hands that are doing the talking and the thinking for them, and they're being immensely creative. I'd like to, introduce, I'd like to take you through um, this journey of mine and where, where, how it's led to where I am today. So we've had a look at how children tend to think about their tangible, their, their interactive world um, from early years and primary, and secondary. Secondary was, uh, I was given a task to teach Year 7 science. I'm not a science teacher. Um, I'm a psychology teacher. I've trained in A-level and I used to teach at university. But a school that I joined in Essex a couple of years ago asked me to teach Year 7 science. And as any normal human would say, oh my God, what? Like science? Me? No, 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 no. no. This cannot be happening. This cannot. No, it's only a couple of lessons a week. They're really good kids. You can make them yours. It's, it's going to be fine. Here's a textbook. Here are the resources. Off you go. So as daunting as it was, I thought, oh my God, I thought, you know, I have to make the most of this experience and I need to just, I need to just face this. It's going to happen. I don't have a way out of this. I have to do this. So I started off as a year seven teacher, you know, stern fed, don't smile till Christmas, as they say. Um, and then I was a monster. I was a complete monster. Oh my God. Um, complete, complete monster. But they had their dates in their books. They had their learning objectives written. Um, they were all ready to learn at the start of the lesson. No problem. And yeah, this is really good. This is actually not bad. Worksheets are ready. Everything's ready. Support staff are brilliant. This is excellent. And then a couple of weeks in, I start seeing students enter in drips and drabs, late for my lessons, books missing. I forgot my homework, Miss. I didn't check. You're thinking, OK, all right, OK, maybe it's just the hormones. Yeah, blame the hormones. It's all about the hormones. It's not me. I'm a brilliant teacher. I know I'm a brilliant teacher. I got outstanding, for God's sake, so I have to be a brilliant teacher. Um, and, I, and I sort of push that push that feeling aside that I've got absolutely nothing to do with, 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 with this behaviour. Um, and you start blaming the child, you start blaming the systems, and things just carry on like that. Until one day, my cleverest student started saying this to me. Science is absolutely boring, miss. 
and I just froze. I thought, what? What? How can you say science is so boring? I mean, how? How can you possibly say? You know, we've been labelling plants. You know what a leaf is. You know what a stem is. You know what the roots are. Um, you know how, what a cell looks like, an animal cell, a plant cell, a brain cell. You've grown some seeds of your own. Surely you, you, you enjoy science. And I started thinking and thinking and stressing and panicking and, and telling my husband and my kids and my mom and everybody that I know, I'm leaving job, I'm leaving my job, I, the teaching's not for me, These, I can't teach, I can't teach to save my life, what am I doing here, how did I get to this position? And it was such a dreadful time for me. I thought, okay, but I kept a little journal, as, as you do when you're in your early years of teaching, and, and I'd reflect a lot and question myself, I'm very self-critical. So I think, well, why am I getting this wrong? What's, what's going on? And I thought, you know what, it might be something so simple. Let me just have a conversation with the year sevens. Rather than ju judging them and saying it's all down to hormones or you're having a bad day or your friendships are broken or whatever. So I did. I asked them, what is it that you guys want to do? And, and I thought that they were going to say, oh, can we watch movies? Can we have free lessons? Can we eat sweets and chocolates? All the things that they're not really, really allowed to do in lesson. But it wasn't that. It was something so simple. It was all they wanted to do was to play, to make and create things and to see whether they worked. And that inherently is science. They wanted, they were natural science, they were natural scientists. And that is because of the way that they had grown up with an experiential world of the physical, in a physical sense. So I thought, okay, this is actually really good. They actually do want to be scientists. So I must be getting it wrong. I probably don't understand my learners so well. Back and forth, asking my mentor and tutors at university, how shall I do this, what shall I do? Oh, just do the worksheets, they're differentiated, it'll be fine. But no, no, worksheets are not working. Something is missing. What is missing? And so I looked at the curriculum at large and I thought, you know, these guys are not really um, ready to use Bunsen burners. I don't think I've used one for 30-odd years. But you know what, with some support, I could probably just fast forward the lesson slightly and get to chemistry lesson where we make some crystals. So I took that very, very big risk of being an untrained lab, science lab teacher to um, get some blue copper sulfate solution, to heat it up, and to see what happens. And, and as expected, it was a planned science experiment. They, they made blue crystals. Um, I thought, okay, this is going to go really pear-shaped. I'm going to have to probably call the ambulance at some point. None of that happened. Um, They'd come in every two, three hours for about two days. Miss, can we see our crystals? Can we see our crystals? Can we touch them? Can we hold them? Oh, they look like diamonds. Miss, can I sell it? And I thought, oh, okay, all right, okay. No, no, you can't sell copper sulfate crystals made in a lab. Um, but, but they were beginning to understand the scientific language of things. And I thought, why is this left so late in the curriculum? Why don't we grab the students early on to let them really understand what science is? And so kind of conversations that started coming out. Can we make more? Can we make blue, red, and yellow crystals? And I thought, wow, actually, that would be so amazing. If I had three weeks to myself, yes. But you know what? We have to move on, and we have to learn about conservation of mass. I'm sorry. And their faces just sunk. Here I could see children wanting to learn. I finally hooked them. The, mag the, magic, the, magic, the magical moments had arrived. And yet, they were passing away again. And I thought, what is going on? Was it the fact that it was the blue crystals, just the color, the color blue? I love blue, it's my favorite color. Was it the fact that they could actually touch and actually feel? And this got me thinking, and that's my son's hand, um, which he actually let me use. And he said, I need to pay money for it. And I said, go away, um, pay you enough money. Um, but it got me thinking about hands. It got me thinking about what our hands do that they think that they make and they create. And I'm using my son's hand with his permission uh, because he grew up very hands-on and I made sure that both my children were very, very hands-on. Playing in the garden, get wet and, wet and mucky, play with Lego, train tracks, cars, whatever it was, painting, drawing, you use your hands. And he, from a very young age, from the age of about two, up till now, he's 12 and a half, still wants to be an aircraft engineer. All his models are about aircraft or, or, or fast cars. And I started thinking about that a lot more at the same time as I left that, year, that school where I was teaching Year 7 to join my current college, which is a design and engineering college. At my interview, I said to my head teacher, I've just been offered a PhD from UCL, and you know, I don't know what I'm going to do about my work hours. How is this all going to work? Oh, what's your PhD on? I said, well, I'm thinking of looking at Lego and the effects of hands-on learning in terms of creativity and motivation. He goes, oh, yeah, yeah, you can do it at our college. And I'm thinking, oh, oh OK, you're going to give me like £1,000 worth of Lego. He goes, no, 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 I'll give you many thousands of pounds <coughs> worth of Lego. And I thought, how is that possible? 
turns out that the college has a Lego education innovation studio, which, which is a very fancy word for saying we have lots and lots of Lego education kits all across the STEM curriculum, ranging from three-year-olds up to 16 plus. And so I started getting really, really excited, and I thought, wow, this is opportunity for me. I have to use this in a very practical way to enhance my own pedagogical practice. And so I started using Lego education. This is one of the kits in my psychology lessons. And a, the new A-level psychology uh, syllabus is quite challenging. I teach in an inner London college, um, and I came from a very academic sixth form background prior to that, so the challenges were very, very different. How do I teach such key studies to these students who've never done psychology before? And this, um, if I was to ask you to guess what famous psychology experiment this is, could, there, could anybody take a guess? It is the Stanford Prison Experiment done by Philip Zimbardo. And the whole point of this was to rep for them to represent it visually in a 3D manner. But not just, not just the fact that, okay, let's make the Stanford Prison Experiment and leave it. There was, a, there was a point to this. They had to think about what could have been improved in the experiment. So they were critically evaluating. They were thinking, what else could they actually do from the, from the perspectives that they could see? I then realized that was such a success. I introduced some more challenging activities using the LEGO Foundations concept of six bricks, where you only use six bricks to, use to enhance learning. Now, this is, this is um, according to LEGO Foundation, this is done with much younger children using the big Duplo bricks. But I said, we're, 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 we are A-level students, sorry. Um, we, can, we can do with the um, regular LEGO brick, uh, system bricks. So I adapted uh, the LEGO Foundation six brick uh, concept to my lessons, where I would just give them the six bricks in different colors, and all they had to do was think of evaluation points or discussion points centered around the color of the brick. So they use the color. If it's red, it has to begin with R. What will be your discussion points centered around the letter R? And before you know it, instead of three, she's got like 10 evaluation points there. So I'm seeing development and progress um, for exam skills as well. I then further adapted this uh, to, for the students as a challenge. It was a, it was a one minute challenge. They were given six bricks and they had to um, make a model of a key study. Um, has anybody heard of imprinting by Conrad Lorenz? Okay, the idea that when, when, when birds hatch, the first thing they see they latch onto. That was, sorry, that was, that was the idea there. That's Conrad Lorenz, those are his ducks. Ideas are sticking, they know what happened in the study, they know the keywords, it's all coming together. And then we get to biology and the brain and neuroscience, which is also in the A-level spec. And I had to think about how do I get my 16-year-old student to learn about the frontal lobe, the diencephalon, the occipital lobe, the cerebellum, and their functions and where they are and what they do. And so a task that I, ab that I absolutely love, which I was exposed to at the London Brain Project, where they were simply using beads to color code parts of the brain in terms of activities. I adapted that with Lego, and I just made up one. So for example, you're making pasta. What parts of the brain are you going to use making pasta? And I just simply matched the color of the bricks to the colors of the regions of the brain. And this is how all the different students make pasta. So somebody might be planning first. Somebody might be getting the pasta out of the jar first. As I said to you earlier, we are a STEM college. We are a tech college. and so. Really, we are really, really lucky to have so much Lego at our disposal. This is we do, where a student is learning how a blender works. He's, made, he's used a simple motor and he's made a blender. And he's showing everybody how a blender works. This is linear motion with mechatronics. So they're learning using Lego at, an, at, at a more engineering level. And that is uh, the EV3 robots. Um, and I'm trained to teach uh, students and teachers on how to use. It's so much fun. I did not know back in school um, at GCSE, I didn't understand physics. I didn't know how motors worked. I couldn't understand gears. I couldn't understand coding and programming and sensors and oh, infrared sensors and things until I had, had the chance of learning it in such a fun way. So now I learn from my students. They'll come and they'll say, well, look, we did this. It can do multiple different things. And, 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 and it's so much excitement. They think they're just having fun and they're playing, but they're actually learning so much. This is very, very recent. Um, this is used, we are a, a digital and tech college, and so my point was to try to break the screen addiction, and in doing that, I thought, how can we actually use Lego uh, to merge the two together? So you've got the digital side, you've got the hands-on um, Lego pieces, what can we do? So what they're doing is creating storyboards. 
They have to write their storyboards out, take little, li every little movement, the little Lego man walking here or turning will be one frame. And they put those frames together and make an animation. So we're making Lego animations, Lego stories in our learning, which is another really big success. The question that I asked at the beginning, what can your hands do? I was interested to see what teenagers, slightly older teenagers would think. So this was, I sent this off to some other schools um, with other colleagues that, I, that I've worked with in the past. Just to, just to see whether there's a difference, because if I'd ask students at my college, I know what their responses would be, because we are a hands-on learning college. And this is from an academic sixth form where they don't really have any other tools. It's purely academic. It's ASTAR driven, um, and, and you get into universities very, very academic. And as you can see, your average 16 to 18 year old is saying things like this. You can pretty much see that some of them are having a bad day because they're thinking about strangling and punching. And I was like, oh, oh God, this isn't a good sign. But most of them to tie laces, to wash things, to pick up things, to text, to hold your phone, pretty much the average thing a teenager would say. Um, and I wanted to dig a bit deeper. So I started thinking about the following questions. Did Lego improve your uh, um, understanding in the lesson? And if it did, did it enhance your understanding? Did you think about things you didn't think about before? Did you understand things you didn't understand before? And so these are the post-its from students in my college. I had so many volunteers, about three, 400 students wanting to do this. But I've taken a sample of ones that, that are pretty much replicated through. And those who are not using Lego in their teaching and learning um, experiences are saying the similar thing to the other school that I showed you earlier. However, these students on the, on, 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 on the left here, they are actually using Lego in their teaching and learning, and they're coming up with things like, it has improved my creativity um, uh, to see variations of 3D Lego models. It helps me to see the solutions of my learning with, with Lego. And for me, this has been, been such a pivotal point because children want to play. Teenagers want to play. Adults want to play. Um, I'm going to leave you with a quote that, that I absolutely love. It's, a, it's from Sean Belloc, somebody I, I really love to read. Um, and he says, the bodily experiences lead to marked learning gains, even seen even seven weeks later. So when they're trying to recall these experiences, the mo it, it looks as if the motor cortex is replaying um, something that they had learnt before because there is a tangible memory. There's a tangible aspect to their learning. And I almost forgot to say that hands can also talk. So I would love to, I would love to encourage you all to um, take some Lego when you are on your way out. Um, and I want you to, what I would like you to do with that Lego is to create something, but it has to be one of your most happiest moments in your life. And I'd like you to create that structure and keep it. You're not allowed to break it up. Um, and thank you. <laughs>